ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for uh, attending uh, this uh, talk. It's part of our series that um, we have launched here at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism to try to introduce more uh, notions of economic literacy and entrepreneurship into the work that we do in, in the communication school and in the journalism school. Uh, I'm delighted to see, um, see you today. I see some repeat, uh, repeat attendees. So you attended our, uh, one of you attended, uh, some of you attended our earlier presentation. But um, uh, as the dean of the school, I just want to say on behalf of my faculty um, that this is some of the most important work that we do. And that we have to understand this both as professionals in communication and journalism and public relations and media and so forth, but we also have to understand it as citizens. Because if we do not have a robust journalism profession, communication profession, we cannot have a robust democracy. Um, and so this is the underlying theme that you will see emerging in some of these discussions. But to understand that in turn, we really have to understand uh, the economics and the market aspects of, of these phenomena. So I'm going to call on uh, Gabe Kahn uh, now, who will introduce um, our, our honored guest, uh, uh, Mr. Doctor, who will, um, if his to, if the, uh, if the uh, uh, picture here is any indication, it's going to be a very interesting presentation. <laughs> I think I recognize one of those guys. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Dean. Uh, okay, welcome again to the second installment of our Media uh, Economics and Entrepreneurship Speaker Series. Our next event is on February 2nd, uh, which will be up in 207, and that's Eric Garland of Big Champagne, who will talk about the ongoing transformation in the music industry. Uh, also, after this event, immediately after, there will be a book signing for uh, Ken Doctor's Newsonomics. Uh, that'll be right here. Um, so briefly, as, as the dean mentioned, uh, one of the things that we're really trying to achieve here with uh, this M2E program is to strengthen and emphasize the connections between the media and communications industry and economics. Uh, and particularly, that is uh, of particular relevance in the news industry. And there's no shortage of hand-wringing about the future of newspapers and the future of journalism. Uh, but what there isn't enough of, really, is kind of a rigorous analysis of the challenges and opportunities that the industry faces. And that's why we've invited Ken Doctor here. Uh, Ken is a native of LA. Uh, he has uh, seen the news industry from a lot of different perspectives. He's been an editor uh, at places such as the Pioneer Press in St. Paul, Minnesota. He has been on the business side for Knight Ritter. And for the last few years, he's been one of the most authoritative uh, analysts of the news industry. Uh, his book, Newsonomics, identifies the 12 trends that will shape the way uh, news is produced and consumed. Um, as I said, that will be available. Uh, and he's also a regular contributor to uh, places such as the Neiman Lab. So uh, I will turn it over to Ken. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It is good to be in the only city, I think, that has had three bankrupt newspapers. <laughs> I think you're right. There's a lot. There's an asterisk. Uh, if you said two, there's a lot of cities there. You have two, but you have three. So it's going to be interesting. So we'll try to have a little fun and uh, move fairly quickly here. I call this plain infinity because there is chaos out there in the news world, as you all know. And I have a sense that there are new ways that publishers of all kinds, new and old, are figuring out how to play that chaos, play that infinity. Tablet is the big news of the year for lots of good reasons, and I'll get into why. Um, most of you are too young to recognize this guy. <laughs> Charlton Heston, Cecil B. DeMille's uh, Ten Commandments. Uh, if you have not seen it, it is a wonderful retro movie now. It's garish color and garish screenplay. And there's Rupert Murdoch, who unbelievably has become the face of the American newspaper industry. And he wasn't even an American until 15 years ago. Uh, over here, The Daily, his new uh, publication, iPad only, coming out probably about two weeks from now. Steve Jobs, the man with the golden tablet. So, into 2011, we're into the year. 
going to give you a very, very short history of the internet and news as I see it, and then touch on why I think we're at an inflection point. Uh, in 2011, talk a little about tablets and paid content. All access is the model that is being used now and in process throughout the American newspaper industry. Talk about that. The rise of marketing services because advertising money is still the core of what supports journalism in this country. And a little on how analytics is really the foundation for a lot of what's happening and why we need to understand it better. The who is very important. Uh, it is people who are creating this future. The future is not just happening, it's the who. Rupert is part of the who. Uh, well, I'd like to talk about a number of people, and you'll see some of these people through the presentation. This is Rob Grimshaw, Managing Director of FTFinancialTimes.com. Uh, very important. I've used the laws from the book here. The 10% rule basically talks about using technology as a 10%, as a 90% layer with humans on top of it. And this is a hard thing for traditional editors to get their head around, heads around, but Rob is doing it really well. Ariana Huffington, a fine job of using lots of other people's content for free. Aggregation is our word for it, of course. Tina Brown, all about niches, magazine, and maybe online. Tim Armstrong, AOL CEO, who claims that he's going to revolutionize the nature of content in the USA. Matt McAllister, a technologist now working at The Guardian, uh, all about using open platforms to multiply the impact of news. Jonathan Mendez, doing similar work in advertising yield, and ha has a new company which is going to be very important this year. Marissa Mayer, she is the woman who built the search business at Google, which has made Google a, a substantial company. She is now working on a little thing called Local. Jim Schachter, editor at the New York Times, behind major experimentation, Bay Area, Chicago, Texas. Jonathan Weber, who is now partnered with Jim, he runs BayCitizen.com as the editor, and they are one of the most important online-only startup news sites to watch. Liz Mitchell, Culpeper, Virginia, one of 600 now patch editors. AOL and AOL's Patch, the largest hire of journalists in the U.S. in 2010. Bob Payne, communities editor at Seattle Times. Jim Maroney, publisher of the Morning News, and who is really trying to move his company from one age to another. Walter Sanchez, small publisher in Brooklyn, who is part of this trend in marketing. Bill Kling, KPPC head uh, at, this, at the CEO level and trying to put 100 new journalists in five markets, five radio markets around the country. And lastly, Kerry Goldberg, who is the combination, a good personification of how topical and local comes together, doing a major health blog now for public radio in Boston. Willie Sutton, <laughs> old time bank robber. This is all about how you figure out how to get some of merchants' monies to support journalism, which uh, we have done for a long time. And then this guy. Now, Sam Zell wrote a book. This is from Amazon. I didn't make this up. No, no Photoshop here. Uh, Money Talks BS Walks, and it doesn't list it as an autobiography, but a, a, a substantial influence. So act one, so the uh, internet news in three acts, the euphoria of, of infinity. Back when some of us, uh, back in the 90s, when some of us in the news business got involved in the web, there was this sense of uh, to infinity and beyond. It was, everything was open. It was a lot of excitement. This was the picture, Steve Case and Jerry Levin, the AOL combination, didn't end well. This could be the picture of our decade that doesn't end well. Google is now struggling, even though they cleared another profit of $2.5 billion in the last quarter. I love this picture, though. This is Eric Schmidt on the left, CEO, and now moving on from being CEO, and the heads of Intel, Logitech, and Sony as if they are taking direction from him. <laughs> Google TV so far has flopped. Hard to know where it'll go, but this, this, I love this picture, and so I'd, I'd like to see it work. The 90s. This is a New Yorker cartoon that sums it up so well. Hey, remember that great chart from the 90s? 
And those of us who were in these companies remember the CEO saying, well, this line, the traditional line is kind of flat, maybe down a little, but this line is going to go way up and it'll all take care of itself. It didn't. Act two, lost in space. Strange creatures like Google and Yahoo all around. All kinds of companies getting big at newspaper companies' expense. They didn't know what to do. Short story, in 10 years, the newspaper industry in the U.S. is now taking in half as much revenue as it did 10 years ago. That's about $25 billion a year less now than 10 years ago, every year, and still sliding. Circulation, long, long slide, actually goes back to about 1947, and it's still going down. And this dawning realization that uh, while the internet was great and it looked like that kind of hockey stick growth, or I guess it would be that way, um, that you only got pennies from internet advertising where you, where you get dollars in print. The understanding here, and this is finally sunk in, but it took way too long, is that there's an infinity to the internet in terms of how much advertising space there is and in, the, in everybody's ability to get to news. And so that meant the world of scarcity, where the LA Times here could say, we're the mass market in town, you're going to buy an ad here, we're going to charge whatever we want, and you're going to pay it, is gone. Same thing largely for broadcasters, although that's waning a little more slowly. And that scarcity has been replaced by plenty. There's worldwide distribution, which is very cool. And we all love it that we can get media everywhere, yet there's no economic model largely for monetizing, making money off of your content in other countries. A big problem. Result, newspapers have been barely hanging on, downsized in every respect, revenues, circulation, products, staff, capital. And the last point is a very big one, clout. So the institutional capacity of having a newsroom of 500 or 1,000 or 200 in a, in a smaller city meant that you were a player at the table. These companies are no longer the players that they were, and that's a societal problem. Importantly, things are not OK, as you might believe by reading some of the press. This is Gannett just uh, two weeks ago, cut three New Jersey papers in half again. The cutting is still continuing. Advertising is still down. This little metric uh, to compare. So that's Google. Google announced fourth quarter, but Gannett hasn't, so I, I stayed with third quarter here. $7.3 billion in the third quarter revenue for Google, $2.2 billion in profit. Gannett, and this is, this is representational here, so you can't <laughs> read Gannett, right? Gannett, the largest U.S. newspaper company, $1.3 billion in revenue, roughly a sixth in revenue. Profits, though, only $125 million, roughly one-seventeenth of the profits. Consequently, you can see that. So that's one company. You could do a similar thing with Apple. You could do it with Facebook. But this is the largest U.S. newspaper company. This that is wouldn't a, be a bad profit margin in other industries. No, it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be. But it's also a sense of relative scale. And, and what they can do in society. So Google has been buying two companies a month for the last 14 months or so. Gannett has not. So after about 15 years of digital transition, still newspaper companies are stuck with 85% of the revenue being on the print side. They have not made the transition. And importantly, this is a number that, uh, that I did some, some crunching on to get to, and I think it's an important number. So you've got a print world that is in <laughs> slow decline. You've got a digital world that is increasing rapidly, a lot of advertising money there, as we'll see. But in the old world, newspaper publishers got 20% of the ad revenue generated in the U.S., or the ad spending in the U.S. In the digital world, they get about 10 to 12%. So in the fastest growing part, they're getting a share, but they're getting half as much as, as they were. This is part of the problem of that transition. Into this year, print revenue still down in single digits, getting close to flat at some of these companies. Circulation revenue is down, and circulation is down. 
both. Staff cutting is continuing. Digital revenue is up. One CEO said to me last week, he said, we're up 30%. Only problem is we need to be up 80%. So they're getting there back into the teens, but that's largely because how they're selling products rather than a real huge growth. And newspapers are the only media type not really recovering after the recession. Even magazines are positive again. Newspapers still are not positive. So we have a new inflection point. And, and importantly, I'm not saying the inflection point, but an inflection point. Why? You pick out lots of factors. I've picked out five top ones. The rise of public equity, the tablet, and what it means, the new news players, paid content, and how advertising is changing. And let's look at each of those individually. So in the US, 14 newspaper companies went through bankruptcy. Uh, most have emerged to various phases of bankruptcy over the last three years now. Uh, Tribune and uh, LA Times and Sam Zell, the most spectacular flame out. Uh, unbelievable, really, in, in a lot of ways. Um, amusing if it didn't really affect uh, the news coverage we all get. Um, but 13 other ones in addition to that. So what happened there was that they, uh, they took on too much debt, largely through acquisition. Uh, revenues cratered. Uh, they did not think rater, revenues would crater. The debt made it unable for them to pay their bills, and they declared bankruptcy. The bankers who had made loans, uh, again, most spectacularly in Tribune, but in other companies as well, um, they're stuck with all this bank, st this uh, newspaper stock. They traded the debt they had for equity in these companies after bankruptcy. Just like with all the homes that are out there and the foreclosures, they don't want to own newspaper companies. They don't really want to operate them. They know it's a headache. They have now sold much of their interest to private equity companies, which are distressed industry companies. And these companies say, just like Sam Zell said, Brian Tierney in Philadelphia, Gary Pruitt a number of years earlier, I guess only 2005, it keeps on looking like these newspaper companies get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and if you could just buy at the bottom, you can make a really good deal. So now, uh, especially um, Alden Global Capital and J.P. Morgan uh, Equity, the equity group of J.P. Morgan, and Angelo Gordon have been, those three companies, have been very active in buying up the equity of the banks who got stuck with the stock after the bankruptcy. They are now essentially heavily influencing at least a half a dozen major American newspaper companies. What they want is more consolidation. They want, their, their ideal thing would be to take a, a blank sheet of paper if we had a whiteboard up here and they'd say, Los Angeles, why would you have Freedom Newspapers, why would you have LA Times, why would you have Media News Group and the LA Newspaper Group? Why can't we put them together in one big company? We can save a lot of money. And we'll, do, we'll, still, do some, we'll still do some journalism and we'll get to the mobile future more quickly. This is what they'd like to do. We will see a lot of roll up, consequently, across the US in uh, the next several years. A tablet is so interesting. Um, basically, I think my headline on it is that it's certifying this new News Anywhere era. So the last three, four years, we've all started using smartphones. iPhone has been a phenomenon. It's a very interesting kind of thing. News companies haven't made much money on it. And, and really, news companies have thought of it as, have thought of this era since um, really the early 90s as, we do two things now. We do print and we do online. We don't really like to do online, but we do online because we have to do online and we'll kind of figure it out. That's our business. <coughs> now it's really changing. It is, we're a news company and we put out the news lots of different ways. And so you got the tablet, you got the smartphone, you have online, meaning desktop, laptop, and you have print. And soon we'll have the TV, whether Google figures it out or not. 70 million tablets are projected to be sold in the U.S. in 2011, 2012. 70 million. 50 million of those iPads, 20 million other. New players are multiplying like crazy. Public radio wants to be public media. 
half a dozen initiatives there, city startups, including Jonathan Weber's in the Bay Area, Texas, Minnesota, Washington, D.C. Investigative players getting a lot of philanthropic money, doing some great work in uh, four or five different centers. We have national online-only companies, and we have a lot of niche players who don't really get a lot of attention. One of my favorite new niche players is Comcast. People have focused on Comcast buying NBC. God knows what will happen with that. They now have 12 sport, regional sports sites around the country. And they are becoming a major regional sports player with lots of video. So the new news pie, right? <laughs> Used to be newspapers, then radio came along, and newspapers took a little thinner slice, TV, online. Now we really have tablets. we got smartphones. Basically, people spend about the same amount of time reading, although there's an asterisk to that. And it's just getting split up more and more. Paid content's getting tested. The newspaper model for decades was advertising money plus circulation money. Online, it was only advertising money and not enough of it. It's like trying to ride a unicycle. Starting basically at the bottom of the recession, Dean Singleton, the head of Media News, and Rupert Murdoch, among others, said, this is lunacy. We've got to get those digital people to pay. We need two legs. This mobile brain toggle, people are willing to pay for things on the smartphone that they weren't willing to pay for online. We don't know exactly why. Ownership of app, something's going on there. Journalism online is making it possible and easier for newspaper companies to sell subscriptions. And then Apple's new subscription policy is changing this. And finally, advertising. Scarcity, you could sell time, you could sell space. Now if you're a merchant, you want to buy Facebook, you want to buy Twitter, you want to buy Google search words. There's a whole world that has opened up to you. So there are companies like, like this company here, Clickable, that is basically seeing, you will see their, green, their dark green ads all around. I've seen them this last two weeks, basically saying to merchants across the country, use us to figure out how to simplify your buying. So with this, this inflection point, because all these things are coming together, we have essentially replacement journalism. What will the replacements look like? We don't know. There are motley replacements in history. But we're getting replacement journalists very, very quickly at this point. We're getting replacement owners. We're getting replacement devices. And we're getting replacement funding. This is all happening simultaneously. And nobody really has a clue as to how it's going to end up because it's like this. It's like when you, it's when you break balls on a, on a pool table, you have no idea where they're all going to go. And there are too many moving forces for us to make a prediction of what things are going to look like in 2015. But the way people are trying to figure this out, and all from the startup level to the private equity level, is by playing infinity. And by that I mean trying to make sense of what is a, a essentially limitless opportunity out there. So act three. Think of a funnel here. And this, this is all of us. This is all of us up here. So now we can go anywhere. We can read anything. We're all potential customers of the BBC or the uh, South China Morning Post or, or whatever. And advertisers have that same choice. Two billion people are now on the internet worldwide, one third of the world, lots of growth still coming. And those marketing choices. So let's look a little at news, news infinity, two billion internet users. It's a big number. And if you look at, if you look at the um, readership of papers, or of newspaper companies. For instance, The Guardian, a very well-recognized and, and, and well-regarded uh, newspaper out of Britain. The Guardian, The Times in, in London, uh, The Telegraph, one-third of their online readership is in the UK, one-third's in the US, and one-third's around the world. Only one-third's in their traditional market. Largely, they can only make money because of how they figured out how to sell advertising and how the internet economy works, still largely on a national basis. But look what they've gotten. They've got now two-thirds of their readers um, away from their home market. New York Times is about 40% about 
of their readers are all around the globe. Yet they're focused on how they make money from the ones in the US for the same reason. But this is another huge opportunity. Essentially, the newspaper industry has been juiced on Google. So I was at Knight Ritter, late 90s, Google came along, we started noticing Google was sending us a lot of traffic, the referrals that we got from Google. And I said, well, that's kind of that's, that's cool. And there were questions. There were questions among the legal counsel of these newspaper companies where should we allow Google to index, basically, the newspaper content? Well, it seemed like a good idea because they were sending us customers. And it went from good idea and nice to have traffic to essentially addiction. And today, 50% or more of newspaper traffic in the US comes from Google and Yahoo and Microsoft. 50, sometimes 60, sometimes 70%. And so this question of how do you have a business relationship with Google if you want to try to write that uh, has become an interesting one. It's largely faded over the last year because of all the paid content stuff and now the tablet stuff. But this question, and Google would say, well, we're sending you all this traffic. Why can't you do something with it? And they'd say, well, we're trying, but it doesn't seem to be making a lot of money. But they couldn't turn Google off, of course, because they would lose half of their readership. So they've been juiced on Google. Another sense of infinity. Pew Internet says that largely because of smartphones, Americans are reading 13 minutes of news a day more. The first increase in news reading in anyone has ever tracked. With the tablet, does that mean people are actually going to read more news because we can read it anywhere? Smartphones. Uh, I imagine most of the people in this room probably have one, but only 20% of Americans who have cell phones have smartphones. We're at the beginning of this market. News anywhere. Let's look at the entertainment models. Very good, especially uh, being in LA, the entertainment capital. Exactly what you hear conjectured about uh, with New York Times today. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. This is the model. HBO, Comcast, um, Netflix, same thing. Very, very simple. Netflix says to you now, you know, forget that DVD stuff. You know, just send us $8 a month automatic over the bank account, and you can access our stuff anytime you want on your, on your laptop, your desktop, or your tablet. And if you still want those DVDs, you know, we got this other plan, about $8. Comcast is saying, very interestingly, there's an Xfinity, which I like, Xfinity, right, app. So, I'm paying Comcast, God knows, $150, $160 a month, and they're saying, well, you can now get your stuff without a sling box through your electronic devices. Again, pay us once, and you get a lot. Kindle Singles is a big idea of mixing and matching content. So what's going on is Infinity, you got all this stuff going on, unlimited potential, but this is a chart from Steve Yeldington from Morris Communications. And, and the way he looked at it, he said, well, basically, yeah, there's a huge amount of traffic coming in, and it's great to count page views, but you can't really make money on at least half of those page views. The great majority of people get one or two or three page views a month. Then you have a few regulars in here, 20 to 30. And if you get to 90 page views a month, categorization as a loyalist or an addict. Another way to look at it. And this is very much at the core of what we're seeing in terms of these all access models and what the New York Times will announce when they, when they finally come forward. So 75 to 80% of those readers are anonymous. They follow a link. Google, increasingly Facebook and Twitter, they follow a link. They're there. They're gone. Another 10 to 15%. This is a registration. It could be registration. It could be they're more engaged. They know the title, but it may not be part of their daily habit. And maybe 5 to 10% are people who are really core. Look at this number. New York Times.com in the US registers about 30 million unique visitors per month. In print, they have about a million, a little less than a million now in terms of single copy and subscriptions. About 3% three, about three, 3 of this. What the New York Times is trying to do with its new plan when it announces its paid plan, is get about 3%. If they got 3%, they'd be ecstatic. 3% of those 30 million uniques, 900,000 people, 
to pay them something for digital access. 900,000 is almost the same number. And probably, uh, they don't know, we don't know, I guess 80% of the people who are gonna pay them are, are print readers as well. So even though you've got this huge 30 million number, you're still back to the same kind of core that paid you in the old world. And so in a sense, we have a back to the future scenario developing. Consequently, all access has arrived. This is the new business model and everybody is aiming at those five to 15% and saying, all that Google traffic and Facebook traffic is good. New York Times is importantly saying, we don't want to cut it off. We want to be able to sell advertising against it and make a little money, but that's the extra money. That's not the core. We have this convergence. We have two-legged business model, the recognition in the mobile marketplace, the tablet's unexpected success, both the 70 million coming, but the fact that early evidence shows it's a great news reading device. People read longer stories, they spend more time on it. And the need to keep the digital ad business growing. If you put up a, just a tall wall and you say, every, either you pay or you can't read it, you lose most of your readership. So the metered approach is the approach that is winning out. And you say, basically, you want less than 20 page views a month, or 10 or 15, you're not gonna ever see a paywall. And that's gonna be most of the experience of most of the people who go to the New York Times keep the ad business growing. And then we have the push given by the, the Apple subscription policy. Apple has not announced this policy, but it has talked to many, many publishers who are all acting on the belief that the policy is clear and it will be formally announced probably when they announce the iPad 2. And it is simply that if you are a news company, you can sell access a subscription access to a digital product, mainly the iPad, but also a smartphone. You can do that, but you can't do it for the iPad and have unrestricted access on the browser. So if you, if you are free on the browser, you can sell an iPad product, but you gotta sell it through the Apple store. You gotta give 30% to Apple and you get very little data or customer relationship. Faced with the want to get more reader revenue from digital sources, to transition with readers as they move from print to tablet, consequently the Apple policy is both pushing and shoving publishers in this direction of saying, let's restrict browser access, let's offer all access. Pay me one price, you can have access across the board. So what we're gonna see basically is three bundles. And a couple, a couple of extra bundles, you might get a, like an, an iPhone only bundle or, a, or a, a price or a Blackberry only price. But essentially print, digital, or print plus digital. This up here is a, a screenshot from the Wall Street Journal. That's exactly what they're doing today. They moved to this model about two months ago now. New York Times does it, Financial Times does it. Uh, we'll see Dallas Morning News do it. We'll see a lot of smaller newspapers, dozens of smaller newspapers do it uh, within the next six months. So will the readers accept this proposal? We don't know. And is this, is this a play for basically taking print readers who are older readers and getting them to value digital access differently and saying we're gonna get a tiny percentage of younger readers who are already used to getting things for free. We don't know. Is it simple and filling? This is a simple proposition. The New, York Times, the New York Times idea and the Wall Street Journal idea may be simply a really good idea because it does one thing really well. It says to everybody there's a value on digital reading if you read our publication a lot and you are now a customer of the New York Times, for instance, across the board. They, have now, they will now make you a customer across the board because if you're a print subscriber, you are getting all digital access as part of your print subscription. So there might be a psychological thing going on here of how you transition everybody from this era of news is free to news has value online. It may be treating the, addition, the addiction and it is importantly making peace with 
flyby traffic. Flyby traffic meaning all the stuff that comes from Google. Not that it is without value, but that it has lesser value. Marketing infinity quickly, digital ads will soon be the leading category of advertising worldwide. US is now third, will probably be first within two years. UK and Japan, number two already. Ads are moving to marketing. Remember, merchants don't want to buy advertising, they just want customers. And advertising was the best way to do it, and mass market of newspapers was the best way to do it. So advertising budgets are fairly flat. Marketing budgets overall are growing. Paid search, a measurable result, is half of all the online advertising in the country. And this is an amazing number. Now, in the US alone, $66 billion is spent on self-marketing. This was a number, I first heard this number in 2006 from a, an associate of mine from, from Outsell, one of the companies I work with. The number was 22 billion, so a third of that five years ago. This is Best Buy, for instance, saying, yeah, it's fine to buy circulars in the LA Times, but we have bestbuy.com, we have all these people's email addresses, we can do direct marketing. Every business in the country is now looking at this. There are eight million companies in the US. You can break it down by email marketing that they're doing and, and social, social stuff they're doing on their websites. They are now spending 50% of their dollars on direct-to-customer relationships, cutting out media, disintermediating media. It's not because they don't like us. They just don't need us. So, translate this to newspapers. For a metro paper, metro papers had it pretty easy. Uh, the, uh, the ad people uh, were derided by the editorial people as order takers, often true. And they would concentrate on the, uh, the biggest buck advertisers and let everybody else go because newspaper advertising was too expensive and too hard to get at. So in a metro area like LA, 8% LA Times, I would guess even 6% of all the businesses here they reached. What that means today as we have this marketing push is that you have a new opportunity of 90% plus in metro areas, in, in mid-sized cities, probably 70% of businesses that have never advertised with that newspaper company. But they don't want advertising by itself, they want marketing, they want customers. So this funnel, they're taking this merchant funnel and newspapers are becoming resellers, they're selling search engine monetization, excuse me, search engine um, marketing, search engine optimization, Facebook, they're selling mobile, they're reselling Groupon, uh, you name it, they're reselling everything that they can. They have changed they, and they are in the process of changing everything they're doing from being an advertising company that sells space to being a consultative selling company that says, how can I help you get customers? They're doing it self-serve. And interestingly here, now we know there's a lot of money in here. You can see all the billions that are at stake. This is a great idea. But newspaper companies are not the only companies that have figured this out. Yellow Pages is deep into it. The local broadcasters are into it. Their standalone national companies are into it. And there is a, comp there is a set of companies which we estimate at $5.1 billion, which is now the marketing services industry, to try to get between the merchants, new middlemen, and these services. Lastly, on analytics. So analytics are, uh, is what is coming to drive the business and important for us all to understand. When we did business development deals in the early internet, we would say, you know, we want some information from you about how stuff works, uh, and you try to get some, and you would hardly use it had nobody to look at it and understand it. It is changing from exhaust, what kind of comes at the end of a process, to a business driver. Newspaper companies, basically, they'd look at the circulation every six months, they look at the monthly revenue and advertising, they didn't want to know a lot. I, I changed Sherlock's quote there. I go back to the FT, the FT is a Financial paper out of Britain actually has more US readers than it has UK readers by, by a hair, worldwide paper. People have thought about it as, well, it's different. I kind of think the Wall Street Journal is different than the New York Times, and the FT is something else, it's foreign, and all this kind of stuff. 
It is their model that is most important. And they are the most advanced at understanding how to use analytics. This again is Rob Grimshaw. And he said, we used to hold and manage data, which would come in, uh, that would be very familiar to newspaper people. And now we're learning from the internet. They're growing on all fronts when you look at their metrics. They're growing in print, they're growing in online, they're growing in advertising, they're growing in circulation. They have an 11 person team and Rob said the only thing, the only rule they had is they didn't want to hire anybody who was from the newspaper industry. <laughs> Hired everybody from consumer packaged goods uh, companies and you name it. Started with nine, now have 11 and they are handing information on a real time basis throughout that company to make decisions. Basically, they're becoming the Amazon of newspapering. A direct internet retailer is how they look at what they do as a news company. They are looking at their readership and watching how their readership is, is reading, how they're reading, what they're reading, and adjusting. They're using it to drive their ad business in all kinds of ways. They're sharing information with their advertisers that they're getting now in, in this quarter on a real-time basis the only newspaper company I've ever heard of doing that. And what they're creating is this new virtuous circle. They're saying, we have all this information, this data going through our enterprise. And just like Amazon, that amazes us, or probably doesn't amaze us any longer, but did at the beginning, where they would suggest stuff that we actually wanted to look at. Books that we would want to look at, other electronics we wanted to look at, because they really were starting to understand us. The FT is trying to do the same thing both with the two core parts of newspaper companies, readers and advertisers. Twitter analytics, doing the same thing now. And this applies to content creation, demand media, IPO coming very soon. Demand media has really turned a lot of newspaper thinking on, on its end, and it's because of how they look at data. They're run by advertising guys who say, Let's see what the advertisers want to advertise. What kind of content would help them reach the right audience? Let's go create the content over here. Let's go find the best people to write it over here, figure out who they are, and put it all in a database. So database, 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 database. Newspaper companies are slowly understanding this and slowly understanding how you can use similar principles and merge them with long-established editorial principles. We see a lot of companies w reaching out for communities and, and uh, high-end bloggers. And this is the key here, of course, is reaching the high end of the blogosphere, whether it's in a metropolitan area or a national level or in any topical area. Two key questions that come out of the whole demand experience, partly out, out of what comes out of the FT. What's your cost of content? There's no newspaper editor that could really tell you that, and no, no one likes to think about it that way. But since it's at base a manufacturing process, you need to know that, and then you need to know what it yields per unit. If you're private equity and you're looking at this business, you're saying it really does come down to this, doesn't it? Or am I missing something? So my point here as journalist, once a journalist, always a journalist is, we better understand this, and not just because other people are doing it, but we can, we can use a lot of these same tools merged with our own beliefs, practices, and principles to really grasp this new world. It's a time of building blocks overall. You can see all that's in motion here, but there are lots of blocks to build with. Metrics aren't what come after, they're what drive the business. And lastly, 11 big questions here. And I'll just run through them very quickly and then see whatever time we have for questions here. Um, how much faster does print circulation drop because of tablet reading? Tablets are going to hasten the, uh, the, the demise of print, but we don't know how quickly. And we don't know how newspaper companies are going to adjust to it. Will all, all access provide a new bottom? Might it work? If it works and provides a stability, then you can grow from there. Where are those tablet reading minutes going to come from? It's great there's 13 minutes more reading so far, the early adopters. That won't last. They got to come from somewhere. They come from print. They could come from, they could come from uh, broadcast. They could come from watching TV. We don't know. Uh, who wins the aggregation game on the tablet? Everybody who won news in uh, the first decade of uh, th this, uh, this century and millennium are uh, aggregators. All the first products on the tablet, single, single uh, title products, with the exception of Flipboard and, 
and one or two others. Uh, on Go announced an aggregation product uh, finally today. There are going to be a lot of people trying to play the aggregation game. How many advertisers do companies have? So this whole marketing services and the 92% and the 8%? How many more advertisers do newspaper companies get? Or any news companies? How fast does this roll up of dailies happen? Is it possible to put together the three newspaper companies in LA? And who's going to stop them? How much does the New York Times uh, experiments in a regional get expanded? It's worked at a very low level. It works very well for them business-wise and in terms of uh, readership. Could they do it in 10 cities and could they do it five times bigger? What kinds of combinations? So we've got all this new media. We've got this old media over here that is rolling up and trying to roll up. We've got the new media up here that is just kind of chaotic. What if they got together in some new ways at the same time these guys are doing a roll-up? Which I think is going to happen in the next two or three years. Both those things are going to happen. How much more cutting of journalist jobs will there be? 14,000 cut in the last five years. How much will local broadcasters continue to gain in the digital world on print? And lastly, what's your question? <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your time this morning. Dave, I don't know how much time we have for uh, questions. We've got uh, at least uh, seven minutes or so. And Good. Uh, folks in the audience, I think we have a microphone uh, over there. You well, thank you for your presentation. You're Very informative. You left it off at a great point, though, at the end, by your focus on content. Yeah. And I wonder, what do you see ahead? How is all this going to affect content, the way it's gathered, the way it's disseminated in terms of first print or first sharing, and then into the aggregation. What kinds of stories, what kinds of things? What is what's going to affect the content we're going to be getting? Sure. Well, so I, mean, I started out with, uh, with those pictures of all those people and the who, and, and it's very purposeful because the, the real answer is it depends what we all do. Um, it is wide open at this point. So we have all kinds of models. You can look at the patch model, and I think the patch model is very revealing where Warren Webster, who's the president of Patch, part of AOL, says they can do a local patch for 4% of the cost of what a local newspaper would pay to produce the same amount of content. Now, that seems suspect to a lot of us, but it could be 8, could be 12, could be 15%. So on a cost level and the creation of journalism, the part of this I like as, as an editor and, and, and someone who values journalism is it's peeling away back to journalism. It's saying, OK, what do you need to find out what's going on? You need somebody who's asking questions. You need somebody who's out on the street. So their model is take a community of 30,000 people. They don't have an office that they can go into or hide in. Right? They've got a tape recorder. They've got a video camera. And they're out there talking to people. And they've got a laptop to write stuff up and feed it into a, a central man a content management system. In a sense, I think we're going to see, and in a sense, Media News is doing the same thing, right? That's probably good in that we are stripping away layers of things that have encumbered journalism for a long time. So that's good if in the recombination, you can think of the recombinant DNA, in the recombination, and we're just at that point now, I would say, oh, it really doesn't cost that much money. I mean, the newspaper industry lost $25 billion a year. Well, we only lost 14,000 jobs. Well, that, that doesn't quite add up, right? So let's strip it away. There's the patch model. There's the base citizen model, which is very interesting, where they say, no, no, we're not paying people $30,000 a year like patch. And we're hiring kind of people who have 10, 15 years experience. They got their pick of people they want. And they're paying well. In fact, they had to defend how much they're paying, which I thought was funny. They're paying good professional salaries. I think what's going to happen is we're going to see all these various experiments which, which tend to strip things away. And then the question really is this very big business question of how you get scale, especially in, in a local and regional area. And, and LA is a, a fascinating test case for that. Where I live in the Bay Area is a fascinating test case. We have um, Bay Citizen has 20 people, probably 30, 40 patches around there. And these are energetic young journalists who are actually doing reporting. We can all criticize different parts of Patch, but they're doing reporting. The Chronicle and Mercury News are shadows of themselves. 
Uh, I think we're going to see new combinations. I think we're seeing great stuff in investigative stuff. The new stuff also is not only pared down in terms of resources and offices and stuff, but it is focused at saying, on education, we don't want to cover the school board. We want to understand what is really changing education in the Bay Area and who the movers and shakers are and what counts. All that's good. I'm an optimist. But I also realize that there are a lot of forces of capital that just want to do things cheaply. And at this point, we're much poorer in journalism than we were five and 10 years ago. We can be richer in journalism and in reporting and coverage five years from now, but it's how we put this together. Thank you. Uh, I, I think there's one flaw with the argument for only the, one. The, I for, think there's more than that for the tablet to be uh, the the next phase. The, yeah. the basic problem is that every application that I at least have on my iPad yeah. has no hyperlinks. In other words, you're basically going back to the old walled garden. You, in other words, Wired wants to keep me inside right. Wired. Right, right. They right. don't want me to go anywhere else. Right. That, to me, I've stopped using those applications completely, and I'd much rather use this just as a web tablet because the New York Times online is much more hyperlinked than the New York Times app. Right. And I think that's a basic flaw. The other basic flaw that I see is that it seems to me that, that Google is basically trying to repeal the laws of supply and demand. I mean, you made a good point that the number of add inventory units is going to infinity. Yeah, yeah. We all know what happens when you have an infinity of supply. I mean, I, I would, my guess is the New York Times business planning 10 years ago would have never estimated they'd have 20 million uniques. Great. But they also thought that the worth of each ad unit would be far higher than right. it is today. That's right. Uh, two quick things on that. Um, uh, in the app world, the app comment, I, I think, is, uh, is very app, uh, apt. Um, what's interesting that's going on, uh, many things right about it haven't been written about. So apps look like a short-term phenomenon. Apps are being replaced by HTML5. And we all read about HTML5 when Apple said no to Flash, and then it's like, well, then we got to go learn HTML5. What's that about? All the technologists I talk to in the news industry say, apps are nice. They're really a two-year phenomenon. They're out there, and for the hyperlinking reasons and, and other reasons, HTML5 make those browser pages as functional, if used well, as much fun, interactive, re, refined as the apps. And so, for instance, at the New York Times and a lot of these companies, they have trained their entire tech staff in HTML5. So either the apps themselves get more web-like or People do what you'll do and, and, and use HTML5. But on the tablet, the uh, browser experience is going to get better and better. Um, the, the infinity in Google thing is an interesting thing, and you're right. The question then becomes, in this infinity, is the matching of how do we get you, if it is an infinite number of placements, how do we get you the things you're most apt to click on and buy? And so Google and everybody else in that world is trying to get smarter and smarter at the matching while fending off the do not track people. Issue, and that is actually I use on my iPad, I access the New York Times through the web browser, and it's a terrific experience, so yeah. I would highly recommend it. But from my perspective, I'm not willing to pay for all access if I have to see ads. I'm going to tell you now, and you can take it back to whomever, but <laughs> consistently, I will pay for all access if I can give up ads, just like I pay for cable TV if I ha can give up ads, because that's what I don't want. You don't want ads. I don't want ads. That's it's truly, truly what I care about is it, when I want to go shopping, and I dearly love to shop, I want to shop. But when I want to read the newspaper, what I don't want is pop-ups. So they want you to pay, let's say, so if they want me $20, to pay, right? They want me, pay, me to pay How $20 How much would you pay not to get ads? I'll pay 5 bucks. I will pay 5 but I will pay 60 bucks a year not to have. That's 5 bucks a month. I pay 5 bucks a month for other for other. Um, functionalities to not have ads on things that I can have for free. So that you may you as an editor, yeah, I'm we'll, we'll see how many people are are, will, are willing to do that. That's what my concern is: yeah. is that a lot of people are going to say, "What I don't want is the ads," because frankly, as as a New York Times reader, 
I'm not interested in ads for products or stores in the city that don't exist here in Los Angeles. What if your favorite publication said to you, um, you're only going to get ads for things you tell us you're interested in? You know what? Those ads come to me in my mailbox, and when I'm interested in I open them up, and otherwise they go into the RAM file. I really only want to be bothered with ads. Recycling. When I'm, uh, uh, right, <laughs> the recycling. Um, I only want to see ads when I'm really interested. Otherwise, they're really intrusive. We'll see how, part, how big of the market your segment is. But the, the, next, the, the next issue that I have, yeah. of course, is that you know, when people provide me with digital content, yeah. It's considerably cheap, cheaper for them to produce in terms of they don't need paper, they don't need ink. They certainly need pa pa paper, pardon me, um, people. And being a writer, I am not cheap here at USC. Um, but it's disturbing to me when I look at an economist, let's say, um, subscription. And it's still really ra a rather expensive subscription. And that you know, you ask me how much would I pay? Sure, I'd pay sixty dollars a year for the New York Times right, right. to have no ads. But I'm, I'm so, so look at the numbers. It's, it's a really interesting point. So the Economist, I know those people pretty well. They figure twenty five percent of their readers are going to be on the tablet in in five years, at least, right? So they're saying we're going to do the quick switcheroo right now, right? And we're going to have more profits at the end than we have right now. You're, you're, but, you're, you but don't I'm, like I'm, I'm telling you, if you look at their subscription price, it, it, it's not substantially less. I know. That's what I'm saying. And it's disturbing. So that's I the have, economist. So I, have, I have not switched So look at digitally. the New York Times. New York Times is, I don't know, $600 a year or something. Seven-day subscription, five $600 a year. Just an incredible amount of money. They're, if they price it at $20 a month, it's $240 a year. What they're taking into account, we'll see if it works, is what you're saying is saying, it's going to be hard to justify $600 a year for a digital-only product because some people out there can do math. But 240 is what we need when we take out our paper costs and our ink costs and all that kind of stuff because we still have all these highly paid journalists. That's the kind of the, the differential they're looking at. Do you buy that or not? Um, I'm going to tell you if they told me it was 240 And yep. actually, I used to pay for the New York Times when they had, um, when it was electronic yep. and limited access. Yep. Because I used to be a paper subscriber. Yep. I wouldn't pay 240 Not for ads. On my dad. One vote for no ads. I think we have one more question here. Uh, you mentioned uh, journalism as, at base, a manufacturing product. Yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about that? Has it always been a manufacturing product and we're just realizing it? Or have yeah. there been changes in the industry that have made yeah, it Yeah, I so? think it always has been. And I think those of us who are journalists, um, and I work for Knight Ritter, which I, I call the silver standard. You know, you know, the New York Times always was the gold standard, and we were hopefully a, at least a part of the silver standard. What, what we learned as editors in Knight Ritter was that uh, we had two responsibilities. We had a responsibility to the company, which was a profit-making company, to put out a really good product and not say stupid things when the car dealers yelled and, and called and yelled at you, you know, um, but also that we were in business as a public service. And what we learned was, and I think all good newspaper companies have, have operated this way with all kinds of issues along the way, you try to balance those two things. And, and as an editorial person, you're, 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 you're understanding, you're working with this company, but your, your bond to that reader is sacred that you, you basically try to tell the truth as, as far as you can see it. But it's a manufacturing process. I mean, it's literally a manufacturing process. And I think what's happened, like with the demand model and all these others, is it strips it away. And pr demand, private equity, any business person. You talk to a business person who doesn't know about newspapers, and they'll say, I, I don't get it. How could you run a company where the, the, only, thing you're, you, the only thing you're thinking about is not profit? I mean, why, why would you do that? It doesn't make any sense. Because it doesn't make sense to anybody else in business, in a for-profit business. So I think it's always been there. What I think is different now is it's been stripped away. And in, in, in a way, and it's like my patch example, it's not bad that it's been stripped away. What it then does is challenge all of us to say, that's OK. Public service in a democracy, in what we think is one of the more important democracies out there, is hugely important and a value. Then how does it get funded? How does it get paid for? That's why I want to see the New York Times get paid one way or the other, right? 
And, um, and whether it's nonprofit, which is great, or for profit, I don't care, but I want this principle to endure because otherwise we're screwed as a country. So it's kind of laid bare, but it's not all that clear to people, and it's not clear to a lot of very smart people in business because they just aren't used to thinking of holding both those things in their mind at the same time. Uh, I think uh, we can do a book signing in the back. I think we have to clear out of the room, but uh, if you want to chat with Ken, you can uh, do that while you purchase his book. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you. On February 2nd, we have another event upstairs. So we'll do that one too. Thank you. Yes. Thanks.